Well, we don't normally stoop quite that low to get a laugh. <laughs> but, uh, well, if you have been around a while, you know that I'm a big football fan. I'm not going to tell you what team I root for because it might upset some of you. So I'm just not going to say that. Uh, like there might be first-time guests here today, and maybe you root for a different team. I'm not going to tell you what team I root for because, you know. But one of the things that I love about the team that I do root for is the team dynamics. I told you we don't stoop that low to get a laugh. <laughs> Only highbrow humor here at Karis City. <laughs> but <laughs> one of the things that I love about NFL teams is how they're made up of completely different people. They're all from different states, sometimes from different countries. They come from different racial and ethnic, ethnic backgrounds. They vote differently. They think different. They even look different. I mean, think about that. Some guys on a professional football team look like they could be fitness models in some magazine. Other guys look like they are 350-pound fat guys that need to take a shower before the game even starts. There's very little in common between a quarterback like Tom Brady and the offensive lineman that protects him. And, and can, I, can I be transparent for just a minute? I don't like Tom Brady very much. I'm just saying, in the most Christian way possible, I don't like him very much. Actually, I kind of do like him now that he's done it as long as he has and he won another Super Bowl, not with the New England Patriots. I like him a little better. But there's very little in common between a quarterback like Tom Brady and the 350-pound offensive tackle that protects him. The only thing they may have in common is that they're on the same team. But because they're on the same team, they're brothers. They will fight for one another. They will defend one another. They hang out together. They root and cheer for one another. They are bound together because they're on the same team, despite all their other differences. Well, we're in the second week of our Grace in Action sermon series where we're working through the book of Ephesians. Ephesians is actually a letter written by the Apostle Paul to the church in Ephesus around 60 to 63 AD, so about 30 years after Jesus died, rose from the dead, and went back to heaven. And what we saw last week is that Paul has a very unique connection with this church in Ephesus, but suffice it to say that he knows these Christians there very well. The city of Ephesus was a large commercial city with great wealth. It was probably second only to Rome as far as being cultured and having conveniences. They had running water and indoor plumbing for bathrooms in certain parts of the city 2,000 years ago. Think about that. That's crazy. They were also a very diverse city. They were a, a port city. They were a trading a hub for the Roman Empire. So there were people from all over the Roman Empire. There were people of different races and ethnicities and nations. They were divided in, in many respects by people of different wealth and status. So the church in Ephesus would have been very diverse as well. Keep in mind that the city of Ephesus was, always, was also a place that was uh, very immoral. It, it, uh, sexual immorality was politicized. It was normalized. Uh, the, the patron goddess of the city for the Roman Empire was Artemis, and she was the goddess of the hunt and fertility. And they lived that out in their ceremonies, so there would have been male and female prostitutes in the temples. During religious festivals in the city, they were filled with eroticism and cultic prostitution and sexual immorality. And so Paul writes this letter to remind this church in Ephesus of who they are in Christ. And, and so the first three chapters of Ephesus, or the first half, is about the grace that we've received, what Jesus has done for us on the cross. And then the second half, or the last three chapters, is how we live that out, how we show grace to people around us. And last week, we started with this idea of who we are. Remember that we are first and foremost in Christ. When we are followers of Jesus, our primary identity is that we are in Christ. And because of that identity, what flows out of that is that we are chosen, we're forgiven, we're set free, we're holy, and we are adopted sons and daughters of the king. This week, Paul is going to change subtly, and he's going to talk about who we are as a group. If our identity, identity individually is in Christ, then how are we joined together in that process? That we're all bound together because we're all on the same team. And, but Paul kind of starts out by going a little deeper into how we all wound up on the same team, and he starts with the bad news. 
I heard a couple of weeks ago about an elderly couple. They, uh, the husband started feeling bad, and for a couple of weeks, he started to deteriorate. He was getting weaker, feeling worse every day. And so they scheduled an appointment with his doctor. They go to the doctor. Doctor does a physical, runs a bunch of tests, has them come back three days later to give them the prognosis. And the husband is very worried about his health, and so the doctor doesn't want to upset him more. So he pulls the wife out of the exam room and pulls her out into the hall and says, I want to tell you where we are. I want to give you some bad news and some good news. He says, the bad news is that your husband is getting weaker because his body isn't absorbing nutrients the way it's supposed to. And so that's causing him to grow weak. But his immune system is also failing, and so he is starting to struggle with more infections and sickness than he would. And if nothing's done, he's going to continue to deteriorate over the next few weeks until there's nothing that can be done for him. And she was very concerned. And she said, so what, doctor, what's the good news? And he said, well, the good news is with proper nutrition and cleanliness, he can hopefully go back to living a, a long life and, and finish out and, and go back to the health the way it was. But here's what's so important. He said, you're going to have to cook three big home cooked meals every single day to get his nutrition up. And you're going to need to religiously clean the house to make sure it's clean and sanitary for him so that he can improve. She said, I understand. So she left the doctor's office and she goes back into the exam room and her nervous husband said, what'd he say? She said, you're going to die. <laughs> so she, she just delivered the bad news. And Paul starts Ephesians 2 by giving us the bad news. Look at Ephesians 2, 1 through 3. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. So Paul starts off and gives us the really bad news. We were created by a perfect God, and we're not perfect. In fact, we're far from it. And so what Paul says is that because of our sin, because of our disobedience to God, we are deserving of God's wrath. Now, that's the bad news, and if he stopped there, it'd be a really depressing letter, and it'd also be a much shorter sermon, but he doesn't stop there. He goes on and gives us the really good news. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in our transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus, in order that in the coming ages, he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace you've been saved, through faith. And this is not from yourself, it is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. So Paul gives us the bad news, that we are dead in our transgressions. Then he gives us the really good news, and says that even though we deserve death, because of our sin and disobedience, that God sent his only son, Jesus, who took that wrath, paid the price of that sin so that we can be made alive in Christ. That's what makes us in Christ. So when we follow Jesus, when we make him our Lord and Savior, we are saved by grace through our faith. And that's what Paul's saying. But then he goes on and he says, okay, so that is your identity. You're all fallen by your own sin. You are all saved by grace, but that then bonds us together so that we are one people out of that. And notice through that whole passage, we see grace over and over again, this word grace. The, the Greek word that was originally used by Paul here was the word charis, which is where our church name comes from, charis. And charis literally means the undeserved or the unmerited favor of God. And so what Paul is saying is that we have received this grace from God and that we are bound together as one people based on that grace. We're united. We're on the same team because we have this common identity. Look at how, what he says next and when he's talking about this team that we're on. This is Ephesians 2, 11 through 22. And notice he's talking to Gentiles, which is us, non-Jewish people. And notice that he starts with the word therefore. And so what he is saying here is, because we are all saved by grace, we're all in this together, therefore. Remember that formerly you who are Gentiles by birth and called uncircumcised by those who call themselves the circumcision, 
which is done in the body by human hands. Remember that in this time you were separated from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel and foreigners to the covenants of the promise without hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made the two groups one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility. By setting aside in his flesh the law with its commands and regulations, his purpose was to create in himself one new humanity out of two, thus making peace. And in one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross by which he put to death their hostility. He came and preached peace to you who were far away and peace to those who were near. For through him, we both have access to the Father by one spirit. Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people and also members of his household, built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. In him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him, you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by the Spirit. Paul gives us the bad news and the good news, and he says we're joined together by that. But there was division in the early church. The biggest division was between Jewish Christians and Gentile Christians. They're, the Jewish Christians, they had been God's chosen people for about 2,000 years by this point, and suddenly the Gentiles or the rest of us were suddenly made part of the team, and it caused problems and divisions. And there were other divisions caused by race and ethnicity and different uh, socioeconomic backgrounds. But this Jewish and Gentile difference was a big deal. And look, there were real differences between the Jewish Christians and the Gentile Christians. For instance, Jewish men were all circumcised. And he's talking about that here. And so that was, that was something they did to show they were part of the team. They had taken a step to show they were part of the team. And the Gentile men hadn't done that. And that frustrated some of the Jewish believers. They felt like that you had to be circumcised to be part of the team. But the Jewish Christians were also used to be being treated differently based on their religion. Did you know actually the temple in Jerusalem was built of this series of walls or courtyards that really separated groups from one another? And, and so they would have understood that. And I want to look for just a minute at kind of a diagram of the Jewish temple in Jerusalem. So... Out, you have this big area called the Court of the Gentiles outside the main temple complex. And this is far, as far as non-Jewish people could go. That wall that you see there in yellow was a dividing wall. Only Jewish people could go through that wall. In 1871, archaeologists actually uncovered a part of this wall, and it had a sign on it that said that foreigners couldn't pass through the gate, and if they did, it was punishable by death. So that's how serious they were. And then inside that wall, there was the court of women. And so in that area, Jewish women could go, but they couldn't go any further. And so there was another wall that you can see that divided the Jewish men from the Jewish women. And then even inside the, the temple complex itself, there were other dividing walls. So even Jewish men were separated. You had to have the certain background, certain cr religious credentials to go further. And, and so when the Ephesian church read this letter from Paul, talking about walls, they knew what he was talking about. He was talking about the walls in the temple in Jerusalem. And Paul's saying in, the, in this new Christian church, there are no longer any physical walls. But then he talks about these walls of hostility. He said Christ came to tear those walls of hostility down as well. See, the problem is that the Jewish Christians were still separating themselves from the Gentile Christians. And people were separating themselves into different groups based on ethnicity and race and their socioeconomic status. And, and look, to a certain extent, we identify with people that have similar interests with us. For instance, if you're at a party and you're talking to somebody and they tell you they have the same job you do, you've now got something in common to talk about. Or if their kids went to the same high school or the same college as your kids, you've got an identity that's common and you begin to have something you can talk about. We can even identify with other people based on past mistakes. There may be people that have very little in common, except they're both in AA. And so they have that common addiction background that kind of unifies them. And, and so some of that is natural, but the problem is that causes problems in the church when we separate that way, because we are all part of the same team. We're, we're all one. 
So there was a psychology experiment done in, back in 1954 called the Robber's Cave Experiment. I don't know if you've heard about that, but it's called the Robber's Cave Experiment because it was conducted at Robber's Cave State Park in Oklahoma. So what they did is they brought these boys in for summer camp, and it was a two-week camp, and they divided them randomly into two groups and put them in for the first week in different camps. The boys didn't even know the other camp existed. So for the first week, they did team building exercises. They gave themselves a tribal name. They had a great time for the first week. And then the second week, they told them that there was actually one camp. There were some other boys, and they put them all together. And what they found is the boys didn't get along very well. The two tribes didn't like each other very well. And this experiment has done, been done several times since then, every time with the same result. And what researchers have found is that when we identify as part of a team, it's not just about finding commonality with the people who are on our team. It's about finding differences with the people who are not on our team. And we don't like people that aren't on our team very much. See, and the problem is the church in Ephesus was made up of all these different groups of people, not just Jews and Gentiles. They were separated by racial and ethnic backgrounds. They were separated by socioeconomic class. So there were slaves that attended the church, but there were also political leaders and very wealthy people who probably owned slaves. And so the church became divided based on all these differences. And Paul is reminding them that Jesus didn't just come to tear down walls between us and God. He also came to tear down walls between us and other people. In other words, the work of the gospel is not just about reconciliation with us and God. Well, that's a huge part of it. It's also about reconciliating God's people, reconciling God's people together. And so what he is saying is that despite all of your differences, you are more unified by being in Christ than you are separated by differences. And, and look, our, our churches today, we don't have dividing walls in our churches, but we still divide up based on different backgrounds. The reality is, is there are typically churches that are made up of mostly white people or Hispanic people, or black people. And, and what happens is we don't see things eye to eye. We don't think about certain things the same way. And so there's this tendency to separate into groups of people that we identify with and we kind of think the same way. And, and I'm going to be honest. I think one of the biggest dividers between white Christians and black Christians is the lens through which we view things. We, we view things through a little different lens and it causes us to think a little different ways, and sometimes we don't understand one another. Let me give you an example. Take an incident where a black man is injured or killed by a white police officer during an arrest. As a white Christian, the first thing that happens, uh, yes, I'm white, if you didn't figure that out, some of you are going to be surprised, but as a white Christian, the first thing is, I'm sad because I know what this incident is going to do to further racial division in our country. But then the next thing is, I want evidence. I want to see who's at fault. And so I'm going to withhold judgment until I see enough evidence to figure out what happened. So I wonder, is there a video that I can watch? Did the uh, person being arrested, did they have a gun? Were they armed? Did the police officer fear for his life? Were other people in danger? How much was this person resisting arrest before this shooting occurred? And, and I'm analyzing all of those different things, and I'm withholding judgment until I see that. See, I view this incident through my lens of never experiencing mistreatment by the police and by the lens of never experiencing racial hatred or racial uh, di di diversion or division. And, and so that's my lens. It just is. And our black brothers and sisters view it through a different lens because our black brothers and sisters may have experienced racial hatred or racism firsthand. They've also heard stories from their parents and grandparents about a day when they had to drink out of a different water faucet, when they had to go to different schools, when they had to sit in the back of the bus. They hear stories about the murder of the Dr. Reverend Martin Luther King Jr., who was an ambassador for racial reconciliation and peace and love. That's a different lens. They have a different perspective that they bring into that moment. And so it's not surprising that they may see that isolated incident different than a white Christian. And, and so I want to talk real directly to 
white and black Christians for just a minute because I think that's a big dividing area in our nation and in our churches. I want to first talk to white Christians. We need to understand as best we can the different lens that black Christians are looking at incidents through. And we need to hurt with and for our black brothers and sisters even if we don't fully understand where they're coming from. We may not understand the emotion they're experiencing. We may not understand the reason they're reacting the way they are, but we need to understand it's because they're looking at it through a different lens. And we can hurt with them and cry with them even if we fully don't appreciate the emotion they're experiencing or why they're experiencing it. So I've got four kids, so I've been through four different births. I've never had pain one time. Never had an epidural, no pain medicine, because I'm tough. <laughs> no, I, I, I haven't had any of that because I have not experienced childbirth the way my wife has. So when my son Doug was born, we waited too long to go from Katie down to the medical center. And so she was way along in her contractions. And so I put her in the suburban back seat and I'm driving literally 110 miles an hour down I-10 at 1130 at night. She's in the, the, the back screaming in pain. We had a very different experience that night. I will say that only one of us risked going to jail, though. <laughs> <laughs> I do not understand childbirth from her perspective. But that doesn't mean that I can't hurt with her and for her. You understand what I'm saying? It's the same with our black brothers and sisters. We may not fully understand what they're going through, but we can hurt with them and for them. All right, let me talk to our black brothers and sisters in Christ. You have to understand that we don't understand. A as hard as we try to see things from your perspective, we don't because we can't. And, and so you've got to be slow to get upset when you see somebody that says something that feels a little insensitive or you see a post on Facebook that you don't agree with. Give us the benefit of the doubt because we're not necessarily trying to be insensitive. We just don't see it from the same perspective. We don't understand it. Now, let me be clear. There are idiots. There are dumb Christians that post mean and hateful things on Facebook. I see them. But most Christians are not that way. And so I would challenge you to give us the benefit of the doubt and, and to try to understand our perspective and where we're coming from and to forgive us when we say something that feels a little insensitive or we say something that you don't understand or agree with. We are all on the same page because we are all in Christ. Look, I should have more in common with a black person who follows Jesus than a white person who does not. I should have more in common with a Christian in China who lives halfway around the world than a white person who lives next door to me that does not follow Jesus. Our commonality, the thing that bonds us together and unifies us is that we are in Christ. That's what's most true. And so we need to stop building walls based on our differences and start building bridges based on the thing that unifies us. Another area where we can be divided is politics. See, we, we start to identify as Team Democrat or Team Republican. And, and we start to get upset with people who don't see things the way we do. It causes us to look at even Bible issues. It causes us to look at church issues through a different lens because we are first and foremost a Republican or a Democrat. We even talk about identity politics because politics becomes the most true thing about us. And so that affects the way we see the world, and we start to dislike people on the other team that don't agree with us. And when that happens, it causes disconnections and disagreements in the church. We're building walls instead of bridges. You, know, you may not realize this, but throughout Jesus' ministry, do you know he almost never talked about politics in his preaching and teaching? Almost never. And at first glance... It almost didn't even feel right. Because think about the political situation they were living in. They were a conquered nation. They lived under the rule of the Roman Empire. In other words, a king called a Caesar. They were a conquered country. And so there was slavery. There was unfair taxation. There was political intrigue. There was violence, corruption. They had very little say in their political future. And so let me be clear. 
what they experienced was way worse than anything Republicans have experienced when Democrats are in charge and way worse than anything Democrats have experienced when Republicans are in charge. And yet, Jesus never really talked about that situation because he was building a different kingdom. He was way more concerned about eternity than he was about politics. And if Jesus didn't talk much about politics, then neither should we in modern churches. I think we've made a mistake as a a church in America here lately is we've traded the power of the gospel for the power of politics. And, And so we've started, instead of trying to change people by preaching about Jesus and teaching about Jesus, instead we're preaching on how to vote and wanting to change people that way. The church throughout all of history has been at its very best when it's focused on humble love and service and truth. It's been at its very worst when it's trying to achieve political power. And unfortunately, we seem to be in one of those phases of history where the church seems to want to trade political power and take that on instead of the power of the gospel. But we shouldn't do that. Jesus transforms heart, and that changes people. See, in our culture today, there's so much pressure for us to choose a side. What what, what side are you on? Republican or Democrat? Liberal or conservative? Police or Black Lives Matter? Vaccine or no vaccine? Immigration or no uh, immigration? Fox News or CNN? We're always being pressured to choose a side. We're pressured by our friends. We're pressured by the TV we watch. We're sometimes even pressured by our churches to pick a side. But as Christians, we don't choose a side. We are chosen. And there's a huge difference. See, here's something we even do worse as Christians. We we pick a side, and then we want to put Jesus on our side. And so we whisper to the people that agree with us, hey, Jesus is on our side. He's He's a Republican. Or Jesus is a Democrat. He's on our side. But I want to let you in on a little secret. Jesus is not on your side. You know whose side Jesus is on? Jesus is on Jesus' side. That's it. Back in his day, everybody wanted Jesus to be on their side. There were actually two groups of religious leaders during Jesus' ministry. There were the, the Pharisees and the Sadducees. The Sadducees were the very traditional, more uh, conservative group of religious leaders. And the Pharisees were less so. And both groups wanted Jesus to pick their side, but he never did. Then they got upset at him because he wouldn't choose a side. The Jewish people that wanted to overthrow the rule of the Roman Empire, they thought surely Jesus would be on their side. They even tried to make him a king by force at one point in time. Surely Jesus was going to be on the side of overthrowing the Roman rule. But he wasn't. He never chose a side. Jesus is on his own side. But then here's what's awesome for us. We've been chosen to be on Jesus' side. Remember what we talked about last week? Look at Ephesians 1.4 from last week. It says, for he chose us. The most important thing about us as Christians is not what side we choose. It's that we were chosen. And, and see, when we understand that we are chosen, then we can reach out to members of the team that look different than us that think different than us, that vote different than us. We can love them, we can be friends with them, and we can hang out with them because we're all on the same team. But let me be honest. If we're going to develop with relationships with people that look different than us, we've got to let our guard down. We've got to take a little risk. There's risk. When I'm preaching about racism, I get a little nervous because I'm worried about saying something by accident that may offend somebody. We've got to get past that. We've got to take a chance to put our foot in our mouth to develop real conversation, have real relationships. And then we've got to be willing to forgive one another the little slights and injustices or perceived mistakes. We have to assume the best of our brothers and sisters in Christ and be ready to forgive one another. We are chosen to be part of this one team. That's who we are. That's way more important than whatever disagreements or differences we may have. See, I I think so often there's this tendency to hang out with people that look like us, think like us, vote like us, talk like us. That's not what Jesus did. Jesus went out of his way to hang out with people that were completely different. You know, if you read much about Jesus' ministry, you see that sinners love Jesus. 
but you also see that Jesus loved sinners. And Jesus wasn't just hanging out with sinners because he was trying to change them. He hung out with sinners because he loved them just like they were. So here's the thing. If our primary identity is in Christ, then our primary mission that flows out of that identity is to bring other people into that same identity and relationship. Look at what Paul says about this in his letter to the church in Corinth. This is 2 Corinthians 5, 18 through 20. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and then gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed us to the message of reconciliation. Listen at this. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. Our, our primary identity is to be in Christ. And then our mission is to be ambassadors to the world around us. We are ambassadors for Christ. It's a little humbling, isn't it? So it's so important for us to understand we're supposed to be building bridges, not walls. We're building bridges for people to get to God. And if we build walls between people, we're also building walls between people and God. Can I be honest with you? There's something wrong with your priorities. If people hear the way you talk about others and they see what you post on social media and they see you as a, a wall builder, not a bridge builder. Because your primary mission is to be an ambassador for Christ. We are supposed to be bringing people together, not keeping them apart. So let me ask you a couple of questions to see if you're an ambassador of reconciliation on Christ's behalf. In other words, if you're a bridge builder, not a wall builder. Here's the first question. Is there a mission you become more passionate about than the Great Commission? In other words, is there some other thing that you're so passionate about, like politics, that it hurts your ability to be a bridge builder for Jesus? Now, the most, most obvious way this happens is you get so passionate about something else that you say things, you put things on Facebook that when you start talking about Jesus, nobody's listening to what you say because they don't like everything else you say. But it can also be more subtle than that. It can just mean you've, been, you've become so passionate about some other cause or organization that you're no longer making the Great Commission your primary mission. So all of your resources and your time and your energy goes to that other activity. Maybe that's something beautiful and good. Maybe you serve at a dog shelter. It's a great mission, but it's not the Great Commission. It's not where your primary passion is. No mission should be more important than the Great Commission. Here's the other question. Have you made your opinions a relationship test? In other words, are there things that you're so serious about, that you're so committed to, that you can't even hang out and be friends with people that disagree with you on that issue? Look, I have strong opinions on certain issues. That doesn't mean that I can't love and hang out with people that disagree with me. You can be absolutely right about an issue and still be wrong. Sometimes we need to think more about being righteous than right. And sometimes those aren't the same thing. Jesus spent lots of time with people who were different than him. Sinners loved Jesus and Jesus loved sinners just like they were. He wanted to influence them. He wanted to transform them, but he loved them right where they are. And we need to be the same way. We need to be able to hang out and love people that look different than us, that live different than us, even people that we think sin in ways that we don't. Because here's the thing. When we get so perfect that we no longer sin, then we can look down on people that sin differently than us. But unless you're different from me, I'm going to struggle with sin from now until the day I die. And until that happens... I need to love and hang out with people that sin differently than I do. Because that's what Jesus did. That's the example. Unity in the church doesn't come from identity of agreement and perfect alignment on every issue. We can have different perspectives and backgrounds and still be on the same team. We're unified by what's most true about us. We are in Christ. We are citizens of heaven. That's who we are. That's our unity. I, I love the Apostle John in the book of Revelation, he's given a little peek into what he heaven's going to look like someday. And here's what he wrote. This is Revelation 7, 9 through 10. This is what he saw when he peeked into heaven. After this, I looked, and there was before me 
a great multitude that no one could count, from every nation, tribe, people, and language, standing before the throne and before the Lamb. They were wearing white robes and were holding palm branches in their hands. And they cried out in a loud voice, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. Did you notice in that description of heaven, there were differences? The Bible says that in heaven, there's every nation, every tribe, every language, every people group are represented there. The differences are beautiful. They're to be celebrated. What unifies those people in heaven is the salvation of God. We are all in this together. And because we are saved by grace through our faith, we are in Christ. That's our identity. We want to be a church that looks like heaven looks, with people of different races, ethnicities, ages, backgrounds, jobs, economics. We want people who have different ideas, people who vote different ways. What we want to be a church of is people who love Jesus with all our hearts and then show grace and love and truth to the world around us. True unity is not going to be easy means sometimes that we have to give up some of our preferences. It means that we have to be not so concerned about being right all the time that we lose our righteousness. It, it may means that you need to be more focused on love and grace first and then share truth. See, if we're going to live out our name, Kara City, we got to lead with grace because that's what it means. We never shy away from truth, but we start with grace. So important. If we are going to be a church that changes our city through grace, we have to be more unified around the gospel than we are divided by our differences. Let's pray.